Hello, um, so my name is um, Raf Viglianti. Um, I'm one of the authors for this presentation uh, and um, I'll be presenting it. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, an undergrounded digital humanities course that my co-authors and I developed and taught uh, for the first time last year uh, in 2020. The course is titled Digital Publishing with Minimal Computing um, and was designed collaboratively by uh, me, uh, Raf Viglianti at the University of Maryland. Um, and by uh, Jimena de Villoyande, Nidia Hernandez, and Romina de Leon at the Consejo Nacional de Investigaciones Científicas y Técnicas uh, in Argentina, or CONICET. Before I get into the contents of the course, uh, I want to tell you just a little bit more about how this uh, collaboration among us came to be. So the University of Maryland has um, um, a program called uh, Global Classrooms um, Initiative. Um, which um, sort of supports uh, tutors and professors on uh, across campus to establish courses in collaboration with universities uh, abroad around the globe. Uh, and the map that is showing you now um, shows the collaborations from 2020. Uh, and in fact, as a result of, of the pandemic and a lot of our teaching moving uh, into a virtual space, uh, the number of collaborations has grown substantially uh, this year. Um, and uh, highlighted are the two universities that were involved in the uh, teaching of, of our course, uh, this Global Craftsman course. Um, and it's obviously the University of Maryland in USA and Universidad de Salvador uh, in Buenos Aires, um, Argentina. Uh, and, uh, you know, partly uh, because, uh, you know, uh, my collaborators are CONICET, which isn't necessarily affiliated with one specific university. And thanks to uh, Jimena's network, we actually ended up with students uh, from multiple countries in Latin America uh, and Europe uh, who enrolled uh, into this course via uh, Universidad del de Salvador. Uh, and while this is an mm -hmm. undergraduate course, we ended up with students. Y, uh, también, eh, como este es un curso subgraduado, también con colaboramos. Uh, 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 universitaire. In general, we started with uh, an introduction to digital humanities because we assumed that most of our um, students may have heard of it, but not necessarily encountered it uh, in detail before. So we made sure to give a good review of, uh, of our view of digital humanities. Um, then we talked about uh, minimal computing, uh, which is a concept you might have heard of, uh, but I'll return to uh, in more detail a little bit later. But the general idea is like, how can we do digital humanities projects uh, with resources and techniques that are accessible to uh, as many people as possible. Um, and then we focused on uh, scholarly editing and digital publishing. And by scholarly editing, I mean sort of the, the critical um, preparation of um, um, historical, of textual historical documents or literary documents uh, to be published. Uh, and traditionally that happens uh, in print, but obviously they can also be published digitally, just like how, just like uh, how the uh, previous presentation was uh, talking about uh, for the public. Um, at the end of the course, we expected our students to become familiar with the latest debates uh, in digital publishing and humanities research. Um, and know the fundamentals of editing primary sources for historical literary research, uh, know how to collaborate effectively as part of an international multilingual team, and have uh, fundamental skills in managing your digital projects uh, and knowing how to create, publish, and maintain a website with minimal technical and web hosting requirements. Um, our students were uh, from the US and from um, Spanish speaking countries, so it was uh, important to us to center and facilitate multilingualism as much as possible. Uh, you know, inevitably, we ended up having uh, joined classes uh, in English. Um, but uh, we tried to counter that by providing um, bilingual course materials such as slides uh, and tutorial, both in English and Spanish. Uh, and we also signed readings uh, in both languages. Uh, we tried to find papers that dealt with um, similar topics and we allowed students to choose between them. Uh, and this was meant to both facilitate content, content acquisition, but also to expose students to contributions that are not exclusively Anglo-centric when learning about DH and scholarly editing in particular. And we were lucky to have some students uh, in, uh, at the University of Maryland who were bilingual and they were sort of empowered to make those choices a bit more strongly. Our hope in doing this was to avoid a north to south approach to curriculum and knowledge exchange, 
to a more synergetic north and south one uh, and aiming at empowering knowledge creation in the language within which an individual is most comfortable. I think we were somewhat successful at this, though the prevalence of uh, the English readings was still evident, especially in group discussions. So it's definitely something we can keep working on in future iterations of the course. We also encouraged bilingual communication between students and tutors, um, such as asking questions in either English or Spanish, and relying on tutors and peers to translate um, and facilitate communication. Uh, we were lucky enough to have, you know, uh, bilingual uh, tutors for the most part. Um, I have decent uh, passive vocabulary in, in Spanish, so I understand it fairly well, although I don't, I, I can't speak it fluently. Finally, after each shared class, uh, UMD, uh, so the University of Maryland and Universidad de Salvador students would meet separately for a lab, for a laboratory. And this created the opportunity for Spanish speakers in particular to review and discuss um, things that they just learned in their native tongue. Um, labs rarely introduced new concepts and rather allowed students to review and work in groups while tutors were still uh, available for feedback uh, and support. The assignments were structured around a group project with uh, team members from uh, both institutions. Uh, we tried to keep uh, the equal, uh, equal amount of students from, uh, from each institution in, in each group. Uh, and the goal was to create a digital edition of our bilingual uh, colonial era text. I'll tell you more about that later. Uh, so project-based learning is not unfamiliar to digital humanities pedagogy, especially given that the age research itself tends to be scaffolded through project work that results in the development of artifacts such as tools or a digital publication, which is what we were going for in this case. Um, so the students attended virtual lectures and collaborated entirely online. Uh, partly this was the result of the um, global pandemic, um, that the course was entirely online, uh, but that in a way ended up even sort of facilitating um, uh, online collaboration, sort of feeling like we were all in the same virtual space. Um, and this kind of online uh, teaching and collaboration is often referred to as a virtual uh, sort of across uh, different geographical areas is often referred to as a virtual exchange uh, or collaborative online international learning. Uh, and this kind of approach offers a form of internationalization uh, at home and can be a kind of a, an alternative to um, study abroad uh, exchange programs that are typically accessible to very limited number of students, or, uh, at least in the United States. Um, our students communicated in English, but with, uh, we encouraged uh, communication in Spanish whenever useful. And interestingly, some UMD students were bilingual, were actually studying Spanish. So there was also a language learning component that played out. So our, the first assignment that, that we gave our students was to write uh, a charter or a set of rules and principles uh, to work together in groups. And we were inspired by the Praxis program at the University of Virginia. Virginia Scholars Lab, where every year they get a new cohort of graduate students. And the first thing they ask them to do is to write a charter how they're going to support each other. And we use that as, as a model for our uh, students. And here we invited students to reflect on group organization, methods of collaboration, but in particular about communication in a multilingualism, in a multilingual uh, environment. And I just wanted to show you a couple of examples. This is from uh, of what they wrote. This is from a group that called itself carbon-based life forms. Uh, and you can see that they highlighted, um, you know, that they will um, use Spanish when it's useful to the group pro progress, that they're going to be uh, patient with others and understanding that sometimes things may be lost in translation. Uh, but also they highlighted how since they were picking up um, coding, some basic coding skills, uh, to be patient also about uh, learning that kind of language, uh, especially for people who had not coded it before. Other groups highlighted how communicating transparently and truthfully is essential to, to work together, uh, especially in order to create a, a project that reflects both the group goals, but also uh, the individual intentions of the contributors. Um, the groups were invited to stay in touch outside of class via Slack, uh, and each group had a dedicated channel and a general discussion channel. Uh, and the Spanish-speaking group ended up creating their own channel as well, which they called uh, La Busal. 
where they practice mutual assistance and taught uh, more freely in Spanish. And uh, this definitely improved the experience of Spanish speakers uh, in the course, uh, but it also created a bit of a fault line between the two uh, language group, uh, with a, a lab group becoming actually a lot more active than, than the general one. Uh, and perhaps a, a possible solution to this will be inviting um, conversation in the general group in any language, even a bit more openly, so that we can achieve a more um, easy uh, sort of language, natural language switching uh, between uh, the two the two language, languages and really foster a multilingual environment. And it, in a way that kind of happened a little bit in Lab USA, where students would pose questions in, uh, in Spanish or have a discussion in Spanish, and I would jump in replying in English, and we would sort of naturally switch back and forth. So uh, to, uh, um, let's talk about the project they created. So they worked on a digital edition uh, of um, a colonial era text by a French explorer, Akaret de Biscay, recounting their journey from uh, Buenos Aires to uh, Potosi in uh, modern day Peru. And we focused on the chapter on Buenos Aires. This work was, is interesting because it was originally published in French, English, and Spanish, but in a, com a completely different historical period. Um, and our students worked on a bilingual edition of the English text from the 16th century and the Spanish text from the 19th century. Uh, and each group worked on the same text, but as we invited them to reflect on how to approach transcription and digital publication, they all came up with different editorial principles and websites. Students learned the basics of the text encoding initiative or DEI format, which is a de facto standard for digital editions and more generally a markup language for modeling information about humanities texts and other research materials. They also learned about Jekyll, uh, which is a static site uh, generator and a static website is simply made of uh, components that browsers can easily understand such as HTML, CSS, um, the foregoing complex um, server-side infrastructure. And any code that they created together was shared and managed using the online platform GitLab, which also acted as a uh, free web hosting uh, for their sites. Uh, we've chosen this technical stack carefully. Knowledge of the TI is essential for anyone serious about digital edition. And despite it being a complex system, its basics are not more complex than learning uh, HTML, for example. But publishing TI via static websites without a complex service side infrastructure is on the other hand, very rare, despite the fact that it makes uh, distributing and keeping ownership of the site cheap and simple. And from a global South perspective, the digital scholarly editing field is perceived as being dominated by standards and technologies that are still unfamiliar to scholars. And this is both because of the lack of multilingual tutorials and resources, although Jimena's work in TI is kind of remediating that, uh, but also because of the means of production and infrastructure are expensive and irksome and tend to serve a North-based uh, academic population. By engaging our students that happen to be from both the North and South with these issues, we want to exhort them to think both globally and locally by recognizing the technological affordances they have access to and why and how, and by confronting the limitations and constraints that work against them, either in hardware, software, education, network capacity, power, or indeed self-imposed by working on a linear technical stack by choice. And if you're familiar with uh, minimal computing, you might start recognizing some of the language that I've been using here. Uh, and these ideas are certainly inspired and strongly aligned with minimal computing principles. Uh, minimal computing originated from a Global Outlook Digital Humanities Working Group uh, that started a debate on power and inequality in the age from a technical perspective. Alice Gill, who's one of the loudest voices in the group, invites the HRs to, and I quote, reconnect with our knowledge production in order to think critically about the question, what do we need, end quote. In other words, we could say, we could say what is the minimal infrastructure that can help anyone accomplish a DH research goal independently as much as possible. In our course, we trained our students to recognize the privileges of having access to state-of-the-art computational resources as well as devising strategies to circumvent limitations they may encounter by adopting minimal computing techniques. And while a static site certainly doesn't embody all principles of minimal computing in the age, it provides the means of engaging with these issues and learn the practical applications of that, particularly for digital scholarly editions. I conclude by returning to the group projects um, and the results. 
as I mentioned earlier, each group worked on the same text, but ended up with uh, different editorial principle websites. Um, and now they collectively own this website as code um, and have made them available on the web. And we had six groups um, and you, know, you can go and check out the websites um, here. It's all the same, just the number changes. And here I've added some screenshots of their editions and you can see that they're all slightly different. And it's not just from an aesthetic perspective. They chose to um, highlight and include or exclude different aspects of the text reflecting their uh, editorial principles. Um, and tomorrow, some of our best students who joined the course via Universidad de Salvador will be showcasing their projects. Um, so I encourage you to visit their Zoom room tomorrow. Thanks for your attention.